This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. And welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only show where you, the viewer, have a voice. Today we are meeting with Melissa Gears. Her and her husband, Anthony, had a um, pretty difficult time with dealing with the foster care system. So we'd like to welcome Melissa Gears to the show. Hi, Melissa, and thank you for being on the show today. Thanks for inviting me. So, I understand that you and your husband have had a pretty difficult time with um, child services in your area. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened and what started this? Sure. It's sort of a long story, but the short end, um, I had premature twins uh, born in November of 2014. Um, and one of those twins had a series of health problems um, that led us to Cincinnati Children's Hospital where we took him to have a craniectomy for his craniosynatosis. Um, uh, we went to Cincinnati because there was a surgeon there that could perform the operation non-invasively, where in Michigan it would have been quite the procedure and quite the ordeal um, with a longer recovery. So we drove to Cincinnati, had the procedure, um, and before we headed home, Joshua was um, vomiting, and we wanted to make sure that it wasn't um, anything related to the surgery, that it was just some kind of virus. So we took him to the ER before traveling home to make sure everything was okay, at which time they discovered he had a rib fracture. Um, and that started our... And just to reiterate for the audience, um, these twins were born preemie, so they had some, they had a rough st start at the beginning. They were not born on their due date, but early. Correct, yep, they were okay. seven and a half weeks early. Um, spent the first month in the hospital and actually Joshua also spent um, another 11 days in the um, pediatric intensive care when he had RSV so he had a rough time all around he actually was in the hospital more than he was in our care between right. the time and RSV can be pretty scary that's um, breathing issues and respiratory distress um, Correct. so like any other loving parents so you decided to take your son in just to have him checked out and make sure he was okay correct yep we just thought before we drove back to Michigan we wanted to make sure the vomiting wasn't due to anything surgical um, and they were pretty sure it was viral but wanted to do an ad abdominal x-ray just to make sure there was nothing else going on and that's when the fracture was discovered okay now that was uh that was a rib fracture, it's my understanding? It was, yes. Now, did they give you any indication what had caused that or what that could be from? No, they just had indicated that it was a healing rib fracture, um, six to eight weeks old. Um, <clears throat> and immediately, uh, you know, said that it could possibly be caused by abuse and they wanted to run additional tests. Um, they did some blood work and did some additional x-rays uh, and also a CAT scan. Mm -hmm. um, and what came back was just still the one rib fracture, no additional fractures, nothing with the CAT scan. Um, so they did let us go home, um, but they did have to contact um, Child Protective Services in Michigan. And they greeted us upon our arrival home from Cincinnati. 
Okay. Were they at your house waiting? Or? Um, they weren't at our house waiting, but they arrived maybe like 15 minutes after we got there. Okay. Wow. Um, so what happened at that point? What did they say why they were there? Did they say what they thought the problem was? We just, everything was just moving so fast. I mean, my husband and I had never heard of such thing. We knew we didn't do anything. Um, so we just trusted that they were gonna do whatever they needed to do and in the end, everything would be okay. Um, so they came to the house and we answered whatever questions they had, um, which wasn't much. And they, um, they put us on a, um, oh. I forgot what it was called, but we basically weren't, we couldn't be left alone with the kids. Um, safety plan, that's what it was. Okay, yeah, safety, safety plan. plan. <laughs> um, so we agreed to that um, while they concluded what they said was going to be an investigation. They also sent us to the hospital to have all of our boys, we have five boys, all checked out. Um, so we went to that hospital that night and they were all checked out. Everything was good. We were told, you know, great job you know you got great boys and um, we went home that night and we were led to believe that everything was okay um, and that they were just collecting doctor's records um, to make sure that everything was taken care of um, and then we were told that they needed to get a second opinion so at that time was it your impression that things were okay that everything was going to be fine and it was going to be closed is that kind of where the doctors and the um, medical professionals led you yes yep definitely we just thought um, it was just a matter of time for them to get their records and get everything under control and um, and we would everything would go back to normal right we started to second guess it a little bit when they said they needed a second opinion we didn't know where that was coming from um, but still we just <coughs> assumed it would work out the way it was supposed to be done. Now up front with the investigation, did they tell you, did they give you any idea how long the investigation would take or was there any discussion um, on the time frame of this from CPS themselves? Initially she said a week, to give her a week, um, but it, it, so this all occurred March 5th um, and a week ended up being two weeks, three weeks. Um, so it, you know, it was a good, uh, the second opinion I think came, I, we didn't even know the, the results of the second opinion, but I believe came on March 30th and then March 31st was when they showed up. Okay. And can you tell me exactly what happened when they showed up at your house on the 31st of March? Sure. Um, my mother was living with us because we were still under the safety plan and following that. Um, and I had my older boys, um, the twins were in daycare, um, and my older boys were getting ready for Taekwondo and we, the doorbell rang. And all I remember is my older boy screaming and running to his room. Um, and when I got to the door, I saw that our CPS worker, um, another woman and about three to five police officers or at my doorstep. Wow. So it sounds like that was really traumatic for the boys. It really was. Um, I didn't realize how traumatic until afterwards when I listened to them talk and recount right. what they remember. But Yeah. So they showed up with no notice. And what, what was it they told you that made you... Um, what what was the reason that they gave you for removing the children at that time? They said that the um, the second opinion doctor had read Thomas, my other son's x-rays, um, and he saw multiple rib fractures that were most likely caused by squeezing. Um, and, and due to that was why the children were being removed. Okay, and just out of curiosity, were any of your children in daycare or anything like that prior to this taking place? They um, they were in like an in-home daycare, um, yes, a couple days a week. Um, and then my mother um, watched them a couple days a week as well. Um, both my husband and I at that time worked full time, so. Okay. So 
It sounds like you had there was a lot going on, but um, what at that point? What did you understand was going to happen, and how did how did it go from that point on? So it was just. Um, <laughs> I just remember putting my boys in their car. My older boys are 10, 8, and 4. And I remember them in hysterics and me telling them um, that we just had to pray and that no matter where they were, whatever they did, they knew that we were with them. Right. And we would fight the fight and we would make sure we got them back. And until then, just to be respectful and give it to God yeah that sounds like really good um, advice that you gave them I know it's a tough situation and you know has to be really hard to watch that happening to your own children um, about this doctor that gave a second opinion one question I have is did he examine all the children no and the funny thing is is now in retrospect when we've done all of our own investigation because nobody else did do one you know not one of these doctors who offered opinions ever met my kids ever examined my my kids um just read an x-ray i didn't know anything about our family they didn't reach out to our pediatrician who's been our pediatrician for all 10 years of all of my kids lives um there really was no investigation so he never even examined none of the children no yet he was the deciding factor to remove them exactly okay um many u.s parents can understand that this just does not sound right I, at this point you know that um you can't make a determination on abuse without seeing the children talking to the children um getting into the background of what's taken place um You've got young twins that have issues from a premature. And in fact, the first thing that I thought about when you said your son had a, a rib fracture was a lot of times preemies will have like brittle bones. Um, they're not fully developed yet. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's the case a lot of the times that they've charged parents with abuse to, only to find out that they actually really do have conditions that cause these issues sure. and not abuse. We knew right away it wasn't abuse, so right away we started doing our own research and looking into what it possibly could be. And you're absolutely right, it's happening everywhere. Um, kids are being removed from families. Um, they jump to abuse. Child abuse doctors are out there, and literally their job is to find abuse. And, uh, I mean, it's it's a lose-lose situation for parents coming into those um, to medical facilities where those types of doctors are on staff um, because it's it's almost a liability to the hospital if they claim not abuse and it ended up being abuse and there's no repercussions for those doctors who um, call it abuse when it's not abuse right so um, yeah it's a very interesting profession that I've learned a lot about, unfortunately, uh, through this ordeal. Yeah, that's, yeah, what's really sad about it is that's how we, most of us learn. Yes. Is through dealing with it ourselves, and that's why we're trying to educate, you know, our viewing audience to what's taking place before they have to deal with it face-to-face. -face. Sure. So... What have you found out since then as far as, you know, speaking to your pediatrician and um, just kind of did they, you had a victory since then? Yeah, so immediately, as soon as the removal took place, um, you know, of course, <coughs> we Excuse worked me. hard at finding an attorney. Little did I know that we needed to each find our own attorneys and be represented separately, but um, we discovered that quickly. Um, we also discovered that uh, you are definitely guilty until you prove yourself innocent in the family yeah. courts. Uh, it's, it's very different. Um, and, and to be honest, unfortunately, nobody, you know, once they remove your kids, there is no, there's nothing, no investigation, nobody, you know, CPS says, 
well, I'm not a doctor, I don't know. And the doctor says, well, I'm not in charge of investigating. I just give right. my opinion. So they're both kind of going back at each other and then leaves the parents to find their own solution, find out exactly what's going on, and that's exactly what we did. We were able to reach out. I reached out to eight doctors from um, orthopedic, um, neonatal, um, radiologist, all different specialties, um, reached out, sent our records to all eight of these doctors, and all eight doctors came back with the same conclusion that the kids had osteopenia of prematurity, vitamin D, their, their tests clearly indicated they were vitamin D deficient, um, uh, as well as infantile rickets. Um, all three of those, uh, and everybody came back with the same conclusion. We were very fortunate that we turned in all eight expert reports on Monday, June 15th, <coughs> and got a call on June 18th to be in the court within an hour, and that uh, DHS was dropping their petition to terminate our parental rights. Okay, so just curious, what exactly um, did you have to do to get your kids home? You were successful in getting um, the information to CPS to let them know that it wasn't abuse, but what did that take for you to get that? So we were very fortunate to have um, a lot of support. So we had over 100 people show up at our um, initial pretrial hearing um, the day after removal. Um, we were kind of lying in the halls of people, and that support system helped us. We, we did not have, um, you know, we, we have five boys. Um, my husband and I work full time. so. We're paycheck to paycheck family, but we knew we weren't going to let money be in the way of whatever we needed to do to get our kids back. We wanted good attorneys who were going to, who realized, you know, so some attorneys out there, you know, will ask you to plea or, you know, try and get it down that way. Yeah. Um, we knew we didn't do anything and we wanted to fight the fight, whatever it took, um, because we were innocent and, um, we believed anybody who saw this case would feel the same way. So we wanted attorneys that would fight for us, um, and we were very fortunate to get that. Um, <clears throat> but it, you know, it, it was costly. I, we estimate, my husband refuses to find out exactly how much <laughs> it cost, but we know that it was over $50,000 that we spent um, in attorney fees. And most medical experts um, were, were willing to look at our case and offer their opinion pro bono. There were a few that we um, had to pay for, for their time as well, but um, right. we were fortunate to have a lot of pro bono doctors who see this type of case on a regular basis and know what happens to families. So, in your opinion, what do you think just um, from where the investigation was going prior to you hiring the attorneys and getting the expert witnesses willing to testify, had you not had the money to put up front, do you feel you would have still won your case? Yeah, my husband and I said that a lot throughout the case, that if people, um, yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely not. I mean, you have to have um, support that will help you, um, as well as, you know, finances um, in order to, to do that and be successful. So, you know, we, we talked about that quite a bit throughout the case. Um, you know, how would other people do what we're doing right now if they weren't in our position? It would be very difficult. Yeah, and that's that's an issue because we we work with people, Dennis and I, um, every day that don't have that money to, for attorneys, for, you know, sure. expert witnesses. And like you said, you know, doctors, they get paid for their time, and rightfully so. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, but in attorneys, the same thing, you know, there's not too many that take on pro bono cases. If they do, they take on the simple pro bono cases, not the difficult ones that are... This is difficult. Yes. <laughs> this was difficult, for sure. Yeah. So, I, I'm, I'm so happy you had the backing of friends and family that were willing to step in and help you out. That's awesome. Um, when you're going through something like this, I mean, that's what kind of kept us going. It was our driving force every day, um, obviously, besides our kids. Uh, it made a huge difference to have that support. And um, 
so I hope you know others out there watch this and are realize there's two sides to every story I think prior to this I always assumed that when CPS got involved that there was a reason that they were involved um, and and even even as we went through this I really believed you know obviously we didn't do anything I really believed that an investigation would take place and would see that we, we didn't do this right. um, so you know do kids get abused absolutely but are innocent families being accused of things that they did not do absolutely well here's the thing it, you know in my opinion it should be the obligation of CPS to get several different opinions from several different doctors and if they feel um, that abuse has taken place then it's also their responsibility to file criminal charges if they can't prove a criminal case then it's pretty difficult for them to say yes the parents are abusing these children um, yeah, no criminal charges no arrest was ever made there there was nothing there right so it sounds like the the night that your boys were, were moved was pretty traumatic has there been any trauma responses that they've suffered that are still they're still having issues with and um just to let the audience know this took place march 5th of 2015 is that correct right. so it was coming up on a year ago correct. so how are the boys doing right now and what's taking place at this moment yeah i mean first of all they're so excited to be at home but they are nervous about they don't they don't trust anybody they don't want uh, we had to change the doorbell on our home because when the doorbell rang it triggered a response they would kind of run and scream and go to their rooms um, they were uh, getting ready for taekwondo that night and they loved taekwondo and we just got them back into taekwondo they refused to go back for almost eight months um, since then uh, we just got them back into doing that they still don't sleep in their room at night their um, two oldest are in therapy my four-year-old reminds me almost every night that I'm his mom and that this is where I live um, so you know you even think that it doesn't affect a four-year-old and it surely did oh definitely it sounds like they're having some issues with PTSD and and trauma responses with maybe a little bit of separation anxiety too which is perfectly understandable considering the situation um, how, can you see them recovering from this issue um, well we're we're working really hard on that we've done a lot of steps we took them to the police station um, and they met with the detective who was working our case and he showed them around the police station so that they wouldn't be afraid of the police officers or the police stations anymore. We actually took them back to um, DHS office and we gave gifts at Christmas to some of the kids that are in foster care so they could maybe see the plus side of the foster care system um, so that they don't have such negative um, trust towards everything um, they're in therapy so we're doing everything we can we encourage them they write stories my oldest writes stories about everything that happened and he was really stuck in writing about the day that they removed him but we've really encouraged him to write about victory and how we want to be a voice for other families and how um, we can work on some change you know uh, we need to work on this child abuse specialty. We need to work on true investigations and changing this guilty until you prove yourself innocent um, in the family courts. Like, so they know that we want to be a voice and that we're not done fighting the fight. And, um, right. and they want to be a part of that too. They want to witness change. And so we're doing everything we can to, to improve what they're feeling. But I think they're always going to have they're always going to remember what happened that's something I'm never going to be able to take away from them as much as I'd like to right well it sounds like they're dealing with it in a very healthy manner and it sounds like as <clears throat> parents you and Anthony are doing what you can to to kind of help them move past that a little bit um, when children are traumatized it's very difficult for them to get through that and to try to gain 
you know, themselves back to as far as they can. But it does take good parents that are willing to take the time to deal with them. Definitely. I mean, there are, <laughs> there are reason for being, for sure. So whatever it takes, we're willing to do it and uh, always have been. And that's what we want them to know forever, for sure. Right. Okay, Melissa. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show. We appreciate you coming to tell your story. Um, I look forward to seeing your boys, yes, helping other you. people, and you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. for watching this week. You can catch us the same time, same channel.